Hi, I'm Peter Ollett. And I'm Katie Steckles. And Peter, what's today's mathematical object? Well, today I've stolen a T-shirt from my son. So um, my, my parents went on holiday to Greece recently and they um, climbed the Acropolis uh, in Athens and went and had a look at the Parthenon. And then the way my mum tells it, um, coming down the hill from the Parthenon, they went in a shop and the shop had T-shirts and they have this T-shirt that shows the um, Pythagorean theorem, Pythagoras' theorem. Um, and so they bought one for me in grown-up human size but they also asked whether there was one for my um my son is three he's about to turn four and uh, the lady who runs the shop sort of mum said she went into the the down some steps into the depths of Athens somewhere and came back with this t-shirt that's really for five-year-olds and is a bit big on him but he loves it um so I've nicked it um so why it's a mathematical object is that uh, this being Greece it shows um the Pythagoras theorem so this is a triangle, the triangle has a right angle, and the way I would say this for the purposes here is that if you've got triangle lengths, I wonder whether to use the letters on the t-shirt. I think it's got alpha, beta and gamma, so yes. a, b and c, I guess. I know, my notes say a, b and c, but in a different orientation, but anyway. Um, so if you have b and c being the shorter lengths, and then the big long hypotenuse is a, in this case then you would say if you put a square of length side length b and a square of side length c then the areas of those two squares if you sum them give you the area of a square of side length a and the reason i'm saying it that way is because the period that we're talking about they didn't have algebra yet so what you might write and what's written on the shirt is a squared equals b squared plus c squared nice and straightforward everybody remembers that which sides are A, B, and C seem to be up to the debate. Um, when I was at school, I was taught O, A, and H, opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. Which yeah, I guess is with, a, with a right angle triangle, you can dis- yeah. define those as unambiguous. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, um, so, but, so I think it's sort of interesting that this famous theorem is, is always expressed as this bit of algebra, even though it predates algebra. I think that's interesting. And uh, an example triangle is, uh, the classic example is if the two smaller sides are of length 3 and 4, then the squares have area 9 and 16, so then the square on the longer side has area 25 and therefore side length 5. So 3, 4, 5 is a, um, an integer solution to this equation. And integer solutions to those equations are Pythagorean triples. Um, what sort of interests me about this is Greek mathematics is said as if it's a thing, but it's sort of not a thing. It's sort of a big mess of different things. Um, and, and that's true in geography. One thing that I think always surprises people is that um, Greece is a country nowadays, but Greek mathematics, an awful lot of that happened not in Greece, the modern country. Yeah. So Pythagoras um, was in modern, what we would call Italy now. Um, and I was looking up some other some other mathematicians. So, sort of, for example, Euclid and Ptolemy are both um, from Alexandria, which is in Egypt, and uh, Archimedes was in Sicily, and that sort of thing. So you sort of have this idea of Greek mathematics taking place, but really, and Greek mathematics being distinct from Egyptian mathematics that came before it, and Islamic, Arabic mathematics that came after it, but actually a lot of them are in the same actual locations. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's more of a time thing than a geography thing. I guess so, or, or, or a sort of era thing, because when we say Greek mathematics, there's a sort of Greek culture that's shared by all these places, but there's also the thing is the language, that they're all writing in Greek, and then later they're all writing in Arabic, and then after that, everybody, the sort of language of science and scholarly communication becomes Latin, and nowadays we would say that was English. Hmm. But at the same time, you often, if you say Islamic mathematics, you often get people being a little bit annoyed at you because there's nothing religious about the mathematics that's happening, right? right? But, um, and you would sort of say Arabic mathematics, not that everyone involved was an Arab, but that they're all writing in Arabic. Yeah. But then for the European Renaissance, you don't call that Latin mathematics because they're all writing in Latin. Yeah. And now we wouldn't say English mathematics because we're all <laughs> writing in English, right? So, so there's that sort of, geographically, that's sort of interesting, I think. Um, and the other thing is it's very displaced in time. 
So the, the very early sort of Greek mathematics, well, for example, some of the early proof techniques were about 600 BC. Pythagoras is 500 BC. Uh, Plato, who was actually in Athens, he's, he's an actual Greek Greek, if you like, <laughs> was about 400 BC. Euclid was about 300 BC. Archimedes was about 200 BC. Uh, even going right through, Diophantus is interesting. So Diophantus wrote a book, uh, and in that book he wrote a page listing Pythagorean triples, going back to Pythagoras' theorem. And that book, or rather a translation of it, is the one that Fermat wrote his note in the margin. Yeah. which became Fermat's Last Theorem. So Diophantus is, is sort of famous for that reason. Well, he was about 200 AD. Mm. So that's from, from 600 BC to 200 AD. There was a bit of stuff going on before that, but you know, even that period is 800 years. Yeah. Now, if you think about from now, 800 years ago is Fibonacci. Yeah. So that's <laughs> this period when um, the most scholarly activity is happening in the Islamic world. They're translating Greek texts, Indian texts, they're contributing... Um, additionally to those and then merchants from Italy and places started to get educated by Muslim scholars and then brought some of those techniques into Latin and Fibonacci wrote this book that was sort of the first um, mathematical activity for a thousand years in Europe or something um, I think you have to say Europe excluding the bits of Spain that were Islamic at the time but anyway right. um, so from there to then go through the entire Renaissance, get to people like Newton and calculus and all the modern stuff and everything yeah. that's happened, that's 800 years. So that's the sort of span that we're talking about. So people talk about as though Pythagoras knew Euclid and Euclid knew mm. uh, you know, Archimedes and they all just hung out together in Athens. And it's just nonsense. Anyway. Yeah. But so. I, I find that really interesting, that the, the difference between where maths was 800 years ago and now, we've got all of the modern mathematics and mm. all the computer-aided stuff and everything that, you know, a lot of the really abstract um, pure math stuff... But I guess it also coincides with a, a major shift in how much of people's time they were able to devote to academic pursuits. Because I guess in the, you know, 800 years ago, you still had people who were basically polymaths who were doing all the subjects. And, you know, you'd have like a scientist or someone like da Vinci who's an artist and a mathematician, you know, who they're not just researching maths full time. That's um, true. Um, but, yeah. They also didn't have television and... <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, yeah, there's a lot less to distract you. But Because there's this yeah. whole thing that people, people, you know, a few hundred years ago would calculate things to ridiculous numbers of decimal places by hand and mm. do all these really elaborate, complicated things that you just think, oh, you wouldn't bother now, you'd just put it in a calculator. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and maybe that also has, mm. has contributed to this kind of exponential growth of, of yeah. progress. Um, so. But it, it's true in all kind of science research, I guess, that, mm. that now that we've got these tools, that it suddenly just opens up massively what you can do with it. Yeah. But it did take 800 years to get from the start of mm. ancient Greek maths to, to the end of it. Yeah, of. yeah. Anyway, so then you get to interesting questions, and one of which is, did Pythagoras exist? Mm. So the thing about Pythagoras is, Everybody knows he existed because they all learned about Pythagoras' theorem and that's I mean, that. Yeah, there's a t-shirt. There's a t-shirt. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's all fine. What We have nothing, I believe, that Pythagoras wrote. Right. And that's not unusual for Greek mathematics because they wrote on papyrus and a lot of it perished. And so the, the reason that we know so much about Greek mathematics is because of those Islamic translations that then got translated into Latin. And, and that's how we, we have a lot of these texts. Um, but the earliest accounts we have for Pythagoras were written after his death. Um, attribute him with divine powers. Right. Disagree on dates by sort of decades in some right. cases. Uh, and, and some of the earliest ones we have are very brief. And then more detail gets added. So there are some a couple of hundred years after he died that give a lot more detail than the earlier ones. Now that might mean that there were earlier ones and we've just lost them. This is one of the problems with studying history, is you don't really know what you don't know. Um, so we, you, might have, um, uh, you might have lost documents along the way. But there's other stuff going on. Um, Pythagoras was a, essentially a cult leader. He founded a school called the Pythagoreans, which lasted for several generations and had some very odd rules. So kind of what you're talking about is people, a couple of hundred years later, writing about the founder of their cult, their religion or whatever, and you can sort of imagine that that might not have been the most accurate mm. thing. And I, I, one thing I think about is, um, for example, if you found a text now about King Arthur, yeah, hundreds of years ago, has divine powers, 
would you believe that that was true or not? Mm. And the one I often use is Robin Hood because I'm from Nottingham and, you know, Robin Hood is one of these characters that, you know, if you only, if all your evidence, ha all the evidence that you had was a sort of, you know, late 20th century book about Robin Hood, would you be able to tell whether mm. that was accurate or whether that was a real person or not? It's ever so hard with the timescales that are involved. Um, one thing we do know is, so the theorem itself, there is evidence of its use in Mesopotamia on clay tablets, which don't perish, right. like Papyrus does, sort of a thousand years earlier than Pythagoras was supposed to have lived. Right. So the theorem was being used long before he existed, if he existed. Now, it might be that he was the first to prove it, and there's this notion that in mathematics you name things after the person who proved it. Uh, I did mention Fermat's last theorem earlier, which we might call Th Fermat's last conjecture. Yes. Or Weil's theorem. Yeah. Um, but we don't, because it was already famous before it was proved. But in general, you often name things after the person who proved them. Now, was this going on then? Who knows? Um, or maybe one of the Pythagoreans proved it. Hmm. I mean, it's just so hard to know, isn't it? Yeah. You can sort of invent scenarios. I heard a talk once from somebody talking about all this sort of stuff with the timescales and things. And he said, you know, for all we know, Pythagoras might have been a baker and they set up shop next to the baker's head. And it was, it was the cult of the people who live next door to Pythagoras. And over hundreds of years, that gets translated. <laughs> but, I mean, you just wow. don't know. You, yeah, it's, yeah. it's sort of nonsense, but it's sort of not. And I just find that um, quite fascinating. So the Greeks, we think, originated mathematical proof. And so they, they, it might be that the proof of this theorem came then. Certainly it was in use before. Very hard to know what's going on. But I think that's all um, all very interesting about history. Yeah. Is there a thing about um, Plimpton 322, like this sort of tablet that was found with Pythagorean triples on? Yes. Completely out of time compared to when we thought it was known. That one has Pythagorean triples on. The other one is, um, there's one which I can't remember the name of, and it's a code YB something or other, um, which has on it a square... And then the square is, has diagonals across it. And one of the diagonals is labelled with a very good approximation for the square root of 2. Right. So if this square was a unit square, then it, the, the side lengths in the terms that we were talking about would be b equals 1 and c equals 1. And then a would be the square of 1 plus the square of 1 square rooted, yeah. which would be the square root of 2. So it's, 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 this, it's in... Um, you know, ancient Babylonian mathematics, so it's base, they had a sort of base 60 system. Um, so you have to, it's a bit complicated to work out, but when you work out what this notation is saying, it's, it's you know, mm -hmm. square root of two to quite a lot of decimal places. So that's a good evidence that they knew about this theorem, because otherwise how else, you know, how are you working out the length of this diagonal? Well, unless it was just incredibly accurate measuring. Yes, <laughs> quite a lot of decimal places, yeah, mm. yeah. Um, the reason I know about that tablet is, well, I have it in my history of maths lectures, uh, but also at the, the Maths Jam annual conference has a baking competition, and I made a gingerbread version of this clay tablet for last year's baking competition at the Maths Jam conference. Uh, so I found a, a, um, a recipe online that I saw somebody uh, tweet about that was for making gingerbread that you can put cuneiform writing in right. with the end of a chopstick. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I did. And I, I sort of practiced a few times and I baked this thing and I think it came out quite nicely. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I remember the, there was a, a couple of years ago there was a bit of a news thing about the Plimpton 322 thing because mm. there was someone... I think had come up with a new theory, in, new in finger quotes, that yes. it was um, that the reason that they had this massive list of Pythagorean triples was because they actually knew um, a better, or you know, they had a, a, a version of Pythagoras's theorem, uh, you know, decades or centuries before Pythagoras. Mm. Um, and it was really interesting because at the time I was asked to come and talk about it on the radio, okay. and I was kind of on the train to somewhere, and I had to find somewhere to go and talk to them when I got there, and that kind of thing. And I was just sort of frantically looking at what is this thing? Right. What's this person actually theorised? Because there's a thing that people on the radio do where they sort of go, "Ah, oh, we need an expert. This is mm. maths. This person is a mathematician. They'll know about yeah, it." Yeah. Right? Well, I quite <laughs> happily went on there and explained what Pythagorean triples are, and, yep. and you know how all of this stuff is worked out, but. I, I couldn't quite see how what this person had done was actually new right. or whether they'd just wildly conjectured, you know, that this might have been a way that you could have done it. Yes. Um, and it, it was so difficult to sort of go on there and say, well, uh, yeah, it's interesting 
uh, that this person has wildly conjectured these things because they don't have any actual knowledge of what was really going on. But it, this is the problem with history is that you, you can only use the evidence you've got. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I guess to some extent that's science, isn't it? You know, you make some physical observations about the world and then you conjecture why that's happening as a, a sort of theory. Um, but, yeah. It's... It is, but you also have flawed evidence in history. Yes. So you yeah. have people with their own agenda writing these things. Mm. And, and also there's an, the influence of folklore because it's it's a lovely story that, the, you know, all the stories about the Pythagoreans that there are, you know, they're, they're good fun to tell as stories, whether they actually happened or not is, yeah. you know. <laughs> sort of so what because they're part of the culture of being in mathematics that you sort of yeah. tell these stories to enlighten you know, enrich your lectures or whatever it is yeah well it's, it's one of the things about maths as a subject is that you can learn all of these things without any of this historical context mm. at all you can just learn about how the equation works but i think knowing that there's this human aspect to it makes it so much richer as a subject mm, definitely so I am on Twitter as at Stex. And I'm at Peter Rollett. And uh, we both blog at a website called aperiodical.com, which is where you can also find more episodes of this podcast. And if you want to send an email and tell me I've got all my history facts wrong, uh, or suggest other objects we might be looking at, then you can email us objects at aperiodical.com. The music is Funk Game Loop by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. Thank you.